Hey everybody, my name is Quickend and today I'm going to be talking about my septoplasty surgery. I'm going to share the story of everything that happened in order for me to sit here today and have a brand new functioning nose. If you're watching this because you are considering a septoplasty, you have a deviated septum, or you're just here for the support, this is going to be the full tale in detail of everything that went down, how I found out I had a deviated septum, how I found my doctor, surgery, recovery. If you have any questions that I do not cover in this, please leave them in the comments below. I will do a follow-up Q&A. I will continue to tell this story. I will make plenty of videos. Just let me know in the comments. If you are new here or you're not caught up with the story, I have had issues breathing for the longest time. What prompted me to seek help is that I have had issues, as far as I can remember, with having a runny nose. For years and years, I have had a runny nose. I have it in the summer, I have it in the winter, I have it through allergy season, I've just always had it. And the most uncomfortable part is before I could eat or taste any meal, I would have to blow my nose. If you know me in my real life, if you've ever worked with me, if you're a coworker, if you're a friend, a neighbor, you know that I have tissues stuffed everywhere. I keep a little tissue pack with me all the time. I can think back as far as McDonald's and using those brown paper napkins to just blow my nose to get some sort of relief. My aprons and beauty school were full of tissues, just like tissues, tissues. For a while, I was okay with it. You know, a boy once called me Sniffles and I was like, well, okay. I didn't become really self-conscious of it until um, a dinner with all of my coworkers. And one of my coworkers, um, you know, I have to blow my nose before I eat. And we all sat down to eat. And it's not one of these like, <clears throat> it's more like a dab. Just a, a dab. And one of my coworkers called it disgusting. After that, I just could not live it down. I felt so self-conscious after that, that I was so hyper aware of all the times I needed to blow my nose. And then after a while, I felt really, really bad about it. And the people that I was around and had to be a part of this like, oh, I just need to blow my nose in order to eat, in order to breathe. So last March in, 2020, I talked to my brother who also has some breathing issues and he showed me a picture of some people and it is a problem. I forget exactly what it's called. I'll pull up one of the pictures. He sent me this picture and he was like, I think this is what we have. And it's kind of just like an overbite that makes your jaw, I guess, pull back and it can restrict your breathing. So I made an appointment to have a consultation so I could speak to an orthodontist, a jaw surgeon. However, March of 2020, my appointment was canceled. And it also took a long time to get that appointment, so I was pretty disappointed. By the time it was January of this year, 2021, I was so completely fed up with my breathing issues and everything like that, I, you know, years I've been looking online to figure out what was going on. And when you Google my nose won't stop running, there's this woman who had a runny nose for years and no one believed her. And then she found out that her, her brain was like secreting liquid. So, you know, that's really extreme. And then there's other cases where people go and they pull like a rock out of their nose and like that has been up their nose for years and they never knew and then they're cured. You hear all these stories and then finally my friend's husband had a broken nose and he was in the process of seeing doctors to get it fixed. I had never really been faced with that before. I've been workshopping diagnoses with my brother and watching videos on YouTube of people pulling marbles out of their nose. But this was my first time to meet and talk to somebody who had a broken nose and was seeing a specialist. So I asked my friend for their doctor's phone number. So when I called the doctor, they told me that they did not take my insurance. 
And while I was on the phone, I was like, I'm sorry, what should I do? Like, I don't know what to do. I'm 30, what do I do? And the secretary was super nice and she gave me some tips about how to find a surgeon. So this might be different in your city or where you are in the world, but in Philadelphia, there are three main hospitals, Jefferson, Temple, and Penn. And if you can get into one of them, then you kind of stay within that network. So initially I just picked a network that I wanted to stay in. And then I went on my insurance's website and I looked up surgeons in the network that I had just kind of picked. And in that, I looked up plastic surgeons. So in there, I was able to narrow down different surgeons and I picked about 10. And then from the 10 plastic surgeons I picked who all had specialized, all specialized in noses, rhinoplasty, stuff like that. I narrowed down 10 and then from the 10, I just picked one. I chose this surgeon based off of Googling the 10. I Googled their names. I looked up reviews. I looked up their clients. I tried to find anything like that. Um, there are kind of like Yelp. There are websites that talk about their interactions with doctors. And as someone who works in customer service, I was a little hesitant to take these reviews at face value, but some of them were pretty helpful in eliminating some of the 10 at least right away. Finally, I landed on my surgeon because I was able to find videos of him on YouTube, just talking and talking about clients, explaining some surgeries, and I felt really comfortable with him. So really, I just looked up his practice and called the number. <laughs> So I was met with an operator who was like, what are you looking for? And when I explained it to her, she was like, okay. I've talked to some people before through this who say that you normally have to talk to your primary doctor who recommends a surgeon. I was able to do that without any of that, just by means of looking up surgeons who take my insurance and then directly calling them. So for me, that saved me a ton of time. And I will mention throughout this video, although restrictions now in June 2021 have been lifted, while I was getting my surgery and doing all this stuff, COVID restrictions were very much in place, which makes all of this just so much more tedious and so much more dragged out. That might not be your experience anymore, but I will include it because it was my experience and COVID restrictions made this process even longer. If I didn't have to get my primary involved, which would have just been three more appointments and just more time and just all of this stuff, I, if I could cut that out of the equation, I'm really happy I did. It's kind of a fluke. I just took the advice of the secretary from the original doctor who didn't take my insurance and just followed it. You might have a great relationship with your primary, but this also gave me the freedom to pick out what surgeon I wanted to. But in all honesty, I just picked somebody from the internet. However, I'm kind of happy with how everything turned out. So when I got to the operator, I was able to make an appointment with the surgeon that I had picked out of the 10. That appointment took about four weeks to get. When I got my appointment with my surgeon, I told him my nose won't stop running. I have a hard time tasting some food. I get out of breath running up the stairs. I felt like though I, I, it wasn't enough. I almost wanted to tell him more stuff. I showed him the picture that my brother sent me about the jaw and the overbite because really I just had no idea why my nose was running all of the time. And that was the big issue. And for years, I told myself it kind of wasn't an issue. It's just a runny nose. So to sit in front of the surgeon, I still downplayed this issue. I still was like, well, it's a runny nose. But really, I should have said it dominates my whole life. I can't live a normal life. It is a minor inconvenience, but one I've had for as long as I can remember. It defines me now. It's a problem. So the doctor took a tube. It's like this long bendy kind of long tube, I guess with a camera and a light at the end. And he stuck it up my nose and it actually doesn't hurt. It's really scary. And I gripped the seat before he did it and was like, eh, you know what, maybe not. But it kind of doesn't hurt. He gets it up there. 
and he looked around, pulled it out, and then I was kind of hoping for him to be like, there's a bunch of rocks up your nose, yay! But he just pulled it out and said that he was gonna order a CAT scan for me. And that was kind of the end of the appointment. He did also tell me that an overbite wouldn't dramatically affect my breathing. Then he also asked me about how my nose looks. And I was able to tell him that my boyfriend had commented that my nose had actually gotten bigger since he had met me. So I'm like, my nose is growing. Is that an issue? I would say my appointment was probably less than 20 minutes total. The CAT scan. So I would say with less COVID restrictions, if you go to this initial appointment, they might order the CAT scan for you right then and there. But with COVID restrictions, there were no waiting rooms. So after my appointment, I had to go home and then wait for an opening to get a CAT scan, which was about two weeks later. The whole CAT scan thing was very unfulfilling during this process because I went in had the CAT scan and then left. I wasn't able to talk to anybody about what my CAT scan looked like. I couldn't take a peek with COVID. I, it was nice, no waiting room, but then you just leave right away. Almost a month went by before I heard anything back from the initial surgeon. Any sort of inconvenience like this can really make you lose steam in the process. So you really have to keep pushing yourself. A lot of my friends were like, call the surgeon back. This is a long time to wait. But eventually I did get a call from his receptionist. They said that they had reviewed my CAT scan and that I had a severe case, that my septum was severely deviated. It's one of those rare moments in life where you hear really bad news, but it's a good thing because you've finally been diagnosed all of this time and all of the research has never brought me to a place where I thought I had a deviated septum. I thought I had allergies. I thought I had a brain leak, but never did I think I had a deviated septum because I just thought it would be more obvious. I thought I would be able to see it. They said that my septum was so severely deviated that they had to recommend me to a specialist, that it was outside of their practice. They also said there was some issues with my septum wall and that there was a hole in it, as well as some other stuff that I'll go into detail with later. So they gave me the specialist and I called them and made an appointment right away. I wasn't able to get into the specialist for about three more weeks. It's crazy because I picked that initial plastic surgeon out of the 10 because some, one of the things he specialized in was noses. I knew something was so wrong with my nose that the plastic surgeon had to call in a specialist. So here is where everything in the process starts picking up and moving really, really fast. If you are looking into this yourself, this is the part where you need to buckle up. You need to write things down because everything is going to move super, super fast from now on. My appointment with the specialist came up super fast. He did the same thing with the camera and the tube, bloop, and he asked me general quality of life questions. I told him my nose runs all the time. And at this point, I really wanted to give them more, but I can't taste salad. I can't taste salad. Help. After that, we really didn't go into much details about really anything else, but I'm guessing my CAT scan spoke for itself. My septum was so severely deviated, it is called an S deviation. And that is when the cartilage in the middle of your nose, your septum, bends one way and then the other. Normally, if you have a deviated septum that isn't severe, the cartilage kind of bends one way and makes it hard for you to breathe out of one side of your nose, which was why I would get questions like, is it easier to breathe out of one side of your nose than the other? And in hindsight, I should have just said no. I would say, yeah, I think I can breathe out of my right side better. Like you wanna just answer questions, but really just be honest because my answer was no. It's hard to breathe out of both sides. So a C deviation would be an obstruction in one side, but the S, if you can imagine, 
curves back and obstructs both sides. Both sides. After that, I was put into a room where I sat on a chair with a bunch of cameras and they took a 3D scan of my head, 3D quicken. And I was also put in a chair and the nurse also just took regular pictures of me. After that, the surgeon said, when do you wanna make the appointment? Fast as lightning. Our consultation was only about 20 minutes. I don't have any experience with surgery before this, but I just kind of felt like, you know, in, in shows and on YouTube, I feel like people, it takes a long time. He even said, I can get you in by the end of the month. And it was like the 16th. Happens really fast. So my surgeon walked me over to the billing department and left me with the billing receptionist and then peace out. He was like, make a post-op before you make the appointment. I want to see you one more time. One more time. One more time. You know, if my nose is no good, my nose is no good. That's it. So at billing, I had to make an appointment for pre-op, a COVID test, surgery, and post-op. So when I met with billing, they told me I had to make a deposit in order to make my appointment. But once I made the deposit, we could start getting all the pieces together to make my appointment. All of this was moving super fast, but I told him that I wanted to have this surgery completely cleared and ran by my insurance before we move forward on anything. Billing told me that with a case as severe as my septum, that there was no way that insurance was going to give us any issues. But still, I knew from my friend who just had their surgery, it, they said it was around $23,000. So I just had to make sure that insurance would kick in and cover everything. So instead of putting the deposit down and making my appointment, the receptionist gave me this red folder. So inside of this red folder is a bunch of information about my surgery, the surgeon, instructions to follow the day before your surgery. And then here's information all about the surgery center, which is in a different building. Information on the deposit and where the deposit goes pre-surgery instructions, a brochure for the surgery center. It seems like they have streamlined everything. There is not a separate appointment where they explain to you where to park. They give you this red folder. About two or three days later, the receptionist called me on the phone and he said that he had spoke with my insurance company and that it looked like everything was going to be cleared, but I still had to make a thousand dollar deposit because there are out-of-pocket costs associated with the surgery. I learn more and more about these costs as time goes on and I watch things on TV. Even John Oliver had a show on Sunday that even explained a little bit more of this process to me, but in the surgery, there were out-of-pocket costs, even though my insurance company covered the surgery. Maybe you are personally more familiar with that, but for me, it was the first time I had experienced that. I hear the phrase insurance covered it so much in life that I kind of just thought that meant free, but it doesn't. And there were out-of-pocket costs associated with the surgery that I can go into more detail with. Depending on everybody's unique situation, this might not be the case for you, you may have insurance that's way better than mine however this was my experience i had had surgery in this network before i had my wisdom teeth taken out by this hospital years ago and i was able to present my case to a board of staff at the hospital in order to allow me to make payments on my surgery in this case i was not able to do it and those out-of-pocket costs had to be paid up front before I could have the surgery. I tried and I know I had done it before. I don't know if it's COVID. I don't know if it's be the surgeon 
I don't know if it's the surgery center. Maybe 10 years ago, it, the policy was just different. I had to pay the cost up front before surgery. Although my surgeon was eager to get going and had availability very quickly, I pushed the surgery date about six weeks out so I could get that money together before my surgery. And I was able to make the payments about a week before surgery. Luckily for me, stimulus check had just hit and everything came together. But if you are looking into this, I suggest getting some money together before even pursuing any of this, because not only were there out of pocket upfront costs, I also lost about a month of work. I'll get into that a little bit more too. So one thing I found super helpful in this process was printing out a calendar from the computer. Once I made my deposit and I was given my pre-op, my COVID, my post-op, and my surgery, and my whatever, it was really helpful for me to print a calendar out so I could write it down, I could see it, I could keep the dates organized, I could keep my partner on the same page as me, and for that I just wanted to share that I have created two calendars for you guys. If you are looking into something similar or you just want to try it out and stay organized, I have created two calendars on my Teespring merch store for you guys to enjoy. I have a digital full color 12 month calendar that starts in June. So 12 months, it will go to May, 2022. I like calendars that do that when you buy them in the middle of the year. I have that full color calendar for you guys to download. You can either have it digitally as your background or you could take it to a print shop and have it printed. I took it to FedEx and had it printed myself for around $14 though I messed it up a little bit, so do ask for help if you are there so they can set the printer up with their little settings. I didn't know how to do that and I was scared to ask for help, be braver than me. I also have a black and white blank calendar that you can just print out from your regular printer and you can fill in the dates yourself. If you wanna check those out, they are linked down below. They're on my Teespring, Quickened Teespring. If you wanna check those out, for me, printing the calendar was super, super helpful. So if you want to stay organized, I just wanted to create those for you guys. They're super cool, fully unique, and I'll, I'll continue. Knowing all of the dates, I wrote them down on my calendar and I put them on a clipboard. That way I kept the calendar downstairs. My partner could interact with it. I could take pictures of it to send to my grandparents. Everybody was on the same page. However, when my pre-op finally came around, my surgeon noticed that although my pre-op, my COVID test, and my post-op were scheduled, my surgery was not. So somewhere the receptionist had made all of these other appointments for me, but had not made my surgery date. Because of this, my surgery was pushed back another week and then was put on a day that I had not requested. In order to get me in, I had to be available for the surgeon. We had initially scheduled the surgery to be on a Friday. That way my partner wouldn't have to take days off of work and could just keep after me Saturday and Sunday. My new surgery had to be on a Wednesday. I said that this wouldn't work, but it was going to push my surgery back much, much further to find another open Friday. So I agreed to the surgery on Wednesday. This is enough to make you doubt your surgeon, but I just told myself that it was reception and not my surgeon who has no hands in what happens in booking and payment and scheduling. While at my pre-op appointment, my surgeon also asked me questions about my stretched filtrum and my stretched conches. If you are familiar with this channel, I do have videos on both my stretch filtrum and my conch holes. These are both retired piercings I got in my early 20s and I no longer wear jewelry in. He asked me, you know, what's the story with these? And I told him I no longer wear jewelry in them and I intend on having them repaired, but the person who did my earlobe reconstruction doesn't live in this country and I'm waiting for them to come back to this country um, for my 
ear, ear lobe and philtrum repair. My surgeon said, you know, I feel really bad to inconvenience you and change around the, sur the surgery and everything like that. He said, how about I repair your philtrum and your conch for $1,500 more dollars? This was a surprise to me. Because of COVID, I went to all of these appointments by myself. And if you're like me, I need to bounce ideas off of people. Sometimes I just need to make eye contact with my boyfriend to even know what is happening in the world. Just to like keep, let my brain keep, I just have to, I just have to like, being at these appointments completely by myself was really tough. With COVID restrictions lifted, I don't think you'll have to go through that. You can have your cousin with you and you guys can look at each other. I didn't have that. For someone to be like, hey, do you want me to sew up your philtrum? I need to know right now. I need to know right now. Although I do want my earlobes reconstructed, um, I told him, I, I don't, I. So he did let me know that reconstructing my philtrum was not going to be as simple as putting a stitch in it. He said that muscle and tissue has been damaged or removed because my philtrum was stretched to, I think, a zero. And that because of that damage, repairing it is a little more involved than just boom, pinching it closed, which is what a body modification specialist would do. Although I've seen them and they look fine, he said repairing this area of your face is much more involved than just pinching it closed. This I also confirmed with body piercer, friend of the channel, Blonius, who did tell me that all of that checks out. There's so much muscle and nerve in your top lip. And I'm learning that now because after surgery, I do not have much mobility in this area of my face. However, I will be making a completely separate video on having my philtrum reconstructed because it deserves its own video because sometimes I feel like I shouldn't have said yes. If you have any questions about my philtrum reconstruction, do leave them in the comments below. With that, I said, yes, um, I will take the philtrum reconstruction because I'll be asleep and we'll be at the surgery center already. So if I choose to do it in a few years, it might be more expensive or it might not be done by a surgeon in a way that it sounds like it's much more involved than just putting a stitch in it. So I said yes to that and no to the conch repair. It's two months later and I do feel some regret about saying no to having these reconstructed. Although $1,500 was a lot to put out and money was super tight during all of this because the expenses even now just keep piling up. At the time, I just really couldn't spend another dollar. And now that it's all said and done, I'm kind of like, I should have just done it. But as we'll get into, recovery was so, so tough. I tell myself that one more fucking thing probably just would have made everything 10 times harder. So the next appointment was for my COVID test. And when I arrived, my appointment was not on the books. I was ready to fight that receptionist. And let me tell you, it is enough to make you really think twice about your surgery that you're getting in 48 hours. Probably going to be different for you, but in order for me to get my surgery, 48 hours before surgery, I had to get a negative COVID test. So I stayed home, I read my little books, and I just didn't go anywhere, not even Target with my little mask on. So when I arrived at the in-network hospital to get my COVID test, my appointment was not on the books. So I had to wait around three hours in order to get it. I posted some of this stuff on my Instagram and the way you guys were about to fight my surgeon, <laughs> I appreciate it. Speaking of which, on my Instagram, which is quiet cool kid, one word, I do have a story highlight all about my surgery recovery. I recommend you checking that out. And you can follow me as well, where I will keep you updated on any new videos or surgery progression as it goes on, as this is only half of the story. 
So up until this point, I really didn't know anything else about the surgery other than what I had written on my little calendar. The night before the surgery, I finally got a phone call. Up until then, I didn't know what time my surgery was at. I didn't know what was going to happen with John picking me up and all of this stuff. The day before I received all of the details via text message. However, I did realize that I was supposed to reply to the text message because once I didn't, I did receive a phone call. So that's kind of comforting. The text message explained what time my appointment would be at and what time to show up to the surgery center. The text message also said not to eat any food or drink after midnight and explained that I could add my support person to a text message hotline where they will be updated and informed as my surgery progressed, sent right to their cell phone. I had my surgery during COVID. So there is no waiting room. So my partner could not take me to the surgery and wait for me. So I went on by myself. <laughs> Can you believe it? After I didn't reply to that text message, a nurse did call me on the phone, which was cool because I had some nerves about me. I was scared. And up until then, you know, appointments were up in the air. Things were wild. Things were moving at 90 miles an hour. Just talking to somebody was nice. So I was like, can I bring my cell phone? And she said, yes, all of your stuff will be put in a locker. She said, don't bring your laptop and, you know, your suitcase and all this stuff. So I did just pack a little like side bag that just fit my phone and my wallet. It's the day of my surgery. I have nothing to do at my house right now besides fuck off. I can't eat or drink. So I took a shower and just had my mouth like open in the shower without swallowing. I'm just gonna walk to my appointment, I think. I think it'll take me that long to walk there. I'm going to pack a small purse. I'll show that to you, feed my cats, and then head off to my surgery. I want to like put moisturizer on or like brow gel, but that would be silly. Here's my bag that I'm bringing. It has, it's just like a small, like, you really can only fit like your phone in it. And I have my bus pass in case I need it and my proof of insurance. I'm gonna send a picture of this bag to John to make sure I leave with it. I think I will, but I don't know. Like, I like, wasn't sure if I should wear a bra. Like, I, I don't know. I'm very thirsty. I'm very hungry. So I am just going to walk. The next morning was Wednesday and it was the day of my surgery. My surgery was scheduled for 9.30 a.m. So because I couldn't food or drink, I actually just woke up and walked to the hospital. I had nothing else to do besides freak out. So you're supposed to wear comfortable clothing for your surgery and I'd actually bought um, like sweatpants and sweatshirt and all of that stuff and I got too nervous to wear them because I don't normally wear sweatpants outside and the morning of I was like I should be completely comfortable and my own person. So I wore like joggers and my favorite t-shirt. I will say between us girls Wear something that you are completely comfortable in. And by that, I mean, once you're done, the nurses dress you. So maybe underwear that is easy to get in and out of, modest, clean, people are going to see it. And if it's something that you're self-conscious about, I recommend a fresh set for the whole, for the whole shebang. You don't want to wear your old study buddy thong because the nurses will dress you. I didn't know this, but luckily I was neurotic about the whole thing and bought a bunch of new underwear before surgery anyway. So because of COVID, there's no waiting room. So when I got to the surgery center at like nine, I just had to wait outside. Luckily there was like a car accident right outside of the hospital. So I watched that for a half hour and then walked inside you know, a, car, a, a slow speed car accident, just two people arguing. When I got to the surgery center, I was checked in and then I was given a pregnancy test. 
me and one other girl were in there watching HGTV. I thought that was a good sign. Christina takes the coast. So this is a good sign. My pregnancy test was over and gave a little peek, negative. And then from there, I was taken up to the next floor of the surgery center, which was the, I guess the operating bay. It was this big bay that was almost cut like a pizza. And there was a bunch of triangle curtains that covered a bed. I walked up to my bed and there were a few other girls also in their little triangle bay areas, kind of shaped like a pie. And then the nurse's center was in the center. So a nurse quickly came over to my slice and she said, undress down to the way God made you. So I was like, just like a bra. Okay. So I undressed completely and then all of your stuff is put into this clear plastic bag that has a seal on the top. If when you go to the doctor and you have to undress and you like hide your underwear, like in your shoe, like, oh, don't look at it. Don't, don't do that because the nurses have to dress you later and they take all of the stuff out of the bag. So just fold it and make it obvious or else you'll go home missing a sock. That's when they also take your phone and they put it in that little tamper bag and then they put it in a locker. So it's your last moment to take a selfie, text your boyfriend, and then they take it away. After that, I was laying in bed and I was met with the anesthesiologist. She was super cool. She had a hoodie on. And the anesthesiologist gives you paperwork that you sign in order to give your consent. A lot of the out-of-pocket costs of the surgery, in my case, went to the anesthesiologist. I've seen on TikTok that a lot of times anesthesiologists are out of network and that's where some of those costs come from. So I do feel reaffirmed, but can I get any anesthesiologist from the damn network in here? So the anesthesiologist had me fill out this paperwork and she said I was more likely to die in a plane crash than in her hands. I said, oh, that's groovy, what the fuck? So the anesthesiologist came over and she gave me a little IV. It was a little needle with a small short hose at the end and it went right in my wrists. I still have a scar from the IV, but I'm pretty sure that I have just like shitty veins. So I think stuff like that happens all the time. So there is still a scar there with your hoodie. After that, the anesthesiologist gave me three pills and my first glass of water that I had had all day. One of the pills I know was for nausea related to the anesthesia process, the process of falling asleep. She explained it to me like, you can wake up and feel car sick, so I give you this pill now that is supposed to help you later. After that, she also gave me something to like, help me cool off, help me feel a little more relaxed. And I have never been put to sleep before. I don't know what this process is. And if she looked me in the face and told me what the pills were, I'm telling you, I forgot. I was like, oh no, I can't drink this water. What if whatever? And she's like, no, it's fine. Drank the water, had the three pills, the one so you don't get sick, the groovy pill. So I was kind of relaxed. After that, an attending came into my little slice and talked to me. He said that he was going to oversee the surgery and that he works under my surgeon. I had to give him permission to be in the room and then sign his little paperwork. After that, he had me explain the surgery I was happening I was receiving in my own words. I don't know any medical terms, so that was the only way I could explain my surgery, but I thought that was interesting. After that, the OR nurse came to introduce herself to me. She was super nice. I felt comfortable with her. She had a Philly accent. I felt great. You know, I also felt groovy, but then she was like, has your surgeon come around yet? I said, no, and she said, hmm, and left. After that, my surgeon came in, oh, in his little scrubs, and he wears like 10 masks. He's so scared of us. When my surgeon came in, it felt like when you're doing, you're playing your concert, your little band concert in high school, and you look out and you see your family and they actually came, 
that's what it was like when my surgeon came in. I was like, he's here, he's here. He's gonna rip my face off. When my surgeon came in, he also had me explain the surgery I was getting in my own words. And then he double checked that we were not closing up my conches. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I had said no at my pre-op right away, but then on his paperwork, he crossed it out. I guess in case I was like, you know what? And now I'm like, well, maybe I should have. A little while later, the woman in the hoodie came back and she walked me to the operating room. I was hoping the OR nurse would walk me to the operating room because I saw her walk another girl to the operating room and she like rubbed her back. And the woman in the hoodie was like kind of cold and frigid, so she just walked me. And even though I had some groovy pills, she was like, you'll be all right. When we got into the OR, there were pictures of my face taped to the wall. So I said, oh, there she is. And nobody laughed. After that, when I walked in, it was like, I don't, the end of your life, when you see all the people you know. I saw the, the attending, I saw the OR nurse, hey. I saw the lady in the hoodie, oh, from earlier. Then they say, open up your robe and lay ass down on the table. I don't know why, but I felt so embarrassed just being covered in tattoos in this moment. Like for no reason at all, I felt like such an asshole having a full back piece in this moment. But it 100% has to do with being naked in front of strangers. <laughs> like that's what it is. So I laid ass down on the operating table and this is when I got completely nervous. I just instantly started crying. I did not want the surgery. I said, this is a mistake. I don't want this. Like I made a terrible mistake. I can't do this. Um, the nurses took the robe off of my top. So I was just, and they started putting the little stickers on you. I think they're the little stickers that, you know, measure your heart rate and stuff during the procedure. And the nurse says, you're not from Philly, are you? And I'm like, what? Why would you, why would you say that? Why, what made you say that? What made, what made you say that? So I was like, I'm from Kensington. And she was like, oh, okay. So the woman in the hoodie had my left arm with the IV in it and she had me lay it straight out. And then they brought up a little small table that is just under your arm. And she attached it to the drip the bag on the wheels, attach the little IV hose to the drip. Then, you know, in movies and stuff, I talk to my friends when they have you like count backwards from 10 or they say, you know, what's your dog's name, all this stuff. My lady in the hoodie brought, gave the little mask and she was like, sorry, it smells a little weird. And I was like, hmm, what's it smell like? And then I gave it a big sniff because she told me it smells weird. I'm crying. <laughs> I took a sniff of that thing and I, I only remember waking up. She fucking tricked me in the most frigid way possible. That's why she has the hoodie on cause she's freezing. She said, this kind of smells. That's her count backwards from 10. She was like, Ugh, this stinks. Fucking. It worked. Because of COVID up until the this smells kind of weird. I was actually wearing my mask. When I woke up, I was just being wheeled away from the position I was in. So I must have woke up immediately after surgery was over and I was being wheeled out of the OR. The attending went, where's your mask from? And I remember being like, Uniqlo. <laughs> my first words, Uniqlo. I remember I had to pee so badly. It was the only thing I could think of. I had to pee. My bladder was full, like full. Like we just passed the last road stop for 50 miles full. I was wheeled back into the pizza room and I was with a new nurse. And she said like, are you in pain? Like what's going on? And honestly, I wasn't. Uniqlo, I'm talking, but I really, really, really had to pee. I had to pee so bad. I told her I had to pee. She gave me a bedpan and I've never used one in my life before, but the instinct, I peed. 
After that, I was still on the drip and the nurse asked me if I was in any pain. I said no, like I, I wasn't. I was talking, I was joking around. It was like my boyfriend has this big bronco, ha ha ha. I was a chatterbox. Um, but she put me on a little more drip and then two nurses came in and fully dressed me head to toe. This was also the first time I had my cell phone back. So a selfie, the nurses put your leg in one at a time and pull it up. They clasped my bra, they did the whole thing. Although I felt good, I was talking, laughing. I was like, oh, I got it, I got it. I did not got it. I, it, I felt amazing. I could not do it. After I was fully dressed, they brought me to an area where I was seated and they crushed up some medicine into an applesauce. I was no longer on the drip. And as I ate my applesauce all at once, I started feeling it. My throat started to close up. I had a hard time talking. I had a hard time moving. I realized I couldn't breathe all of, out of my nose. All of this stuff started to happen pretty quickly once I was off of the drip. So back then when I was like, no, I'm not in any pain at all. It is because of the drip. Minutes after it was out, I just slowly, slowly, slowly just decayed. My partner this entire time was on this text line with the hospital and they let me know that he would be there in 30 minutes. It felt like way less than 30 minutes before he arrived because he called them and I finished my applesauce and they put me on a wheelchair and they wheeled me out to the Bronco. I'm sure the nurse thought that I was crazy when I was like, he's got this big Bronco. And her face when I was wheeled up to this giant Bronco was just like, I thought she was crazy. <laughs> of course, the Bronco is a giant truck. So John had to pick me up and put me in it. The surgery center gave me to go home, a pack of gauze, a small basin, um, special gauze that goes over your eyes, a prescription nasal spray, and two prescriptions, antibiotics and Oxycontin. On the way home, I said, you know, let's pick up the prescriptions. I'm losing life as we go. The doctor had not Set, sent in the painkiller prescription yet, but after we called them, it was there. At this point, you're like, you're just a quirky surgeon, huh? When we got home, John pulled out our pullout sofa and that's where I stayed for the next two to three weeks. This is what I really recommend. If we were sleeping in the same bed, I think it would have just been too uncomfortable, too, too risky. My abilities went on a steady decline once we got home. My, I lost my voice, my eyes swelled shut. And as the painkiller initially left, and then you're now on the new painkiller, it was just all really uncomfortable. And I felt really weak. We were, pres the painkiller was prescribed for one pill every four hours, but I believe we were only given six pills so we did two pills a day instead. In the States, that's just kind of an issue. So that's what happened here. If you were having this surgery in a different country, it might be completely different. Like one thing that is pretty different is my surgery started around 10 a.m. and I was sent home from the surgery center by three. So I was in the care of the hospital for only a few hours. Then they send you home. You know, I grew up watching Disney movies. They're fine. As an adult, I have not revisited them. Not for any reason, I just kind of haven't. Once I got home from surgery, just another person took over because I was like, I want to watch Hercules. If you even quizzed me a week before about Hercules, I might not even have remembered it was a movie. Just, I watched Hercules, I watched Robin Hood, I watched Legally Blonde, all feel-good movies. 
I just could, I didn't have it. I couldn't watch the news. It was way too upsetting. I just, it had to, I can't tell you why. I did watch Zack and Miri make a porno, but again, that's kind of like one of my feel good movies, I guess. Because surgery was rescheduled for a Wednesday, um, my partner had work. So John did go to work the next day, but it kind of all worked out. While I was recovering, I would just sleep. While he was gone, I was asleep the entire time. Before he went to work, he woke me up, he gave me my antibiotic, he gave me my painkiller, and then I went back to sleep. My neighbor was texting me and was completely aware of everything that was happening, but when John got home, he woke me up and it was like he wasn't even gone. He did come home early from work. We also set up furniture to my downstairs bathroom so I could feel it as I walked to the toilet. All I could do was drink water, so that was perfectly fine and safe. We just set up like a chair and stuff so I could feel it to walk to the bathroom. You can see a little bit. If you really, you can, you can, but it's not sight. You can't use your phone. So my eyes swelled shut. Um, I could not talk because you can't close your mouth. Your nose is completely stuffed full. You can't use your nose. You have to breathe through your, no your mouth at all times. You can't close it. And I'm thinking because of the surgery, because the mask couldn't go over my nose, I'm thinking a surgical tube went down my throat. My throat was so raw and just so dry and so sad that talking was just completely out of the question and eating was really difficult too. They say that your nose surgery, all of that, you also have nerve endings in your teeth that are affected by all of this. So your teeth hurt. For me, I just couldn't eat. I couldn't chew, I couldn't eat. My philtrum, obviously my mouth had also had surgery, so that's going to be different from your experience, but I couldn't eat and it made me super, super weak. Also, I really couldn't move my face to talk if I wanted to. And I had baby brain. So I was wearing, it's this little piece of foam that rests here on your upper lip and then goes around your ears like a mask and comes back down. And it supports a piece of gauze that rests on your nose. I made the decision to not show any blood or surgery in this video. I have my little face bra, but it has blood on it, so I'm not showing it. So you'll just have to imagine. I also had the cast on my nose and I was wearing a face mask that they gave me at the hospital that was like, I don't know, XL. It was just like this. Although I was in my house and not afraid of contracting COVID, wearing the mask was super helpful because the air I was breathing wasn't like super dry. And because I couldn't close my mouth, having the mask on was almost like my only chance at having a closed mouth. And let's be real, I looked really scary. It is very vulnerable to sit in front of your partner in which you need to be hot in front of and look really scary. My face swelled up so much that I didn't have under eye bags anymore. It's cruel because you also look really scary, but you're like, work. I was so full, I didn't have under eye bags. I was so full, my forehead came out. And then my jowls. I also look like a pound puppy. Fright. I slept with the mask on too, because at night it was so dry. Cause you have to sit, you can't sleep laying down. You have to sit up to sleep and it's dry and your mouth is just hung open. It's miserable. It's so uncomfortable, but it's awake for a few hours, asleep for a few hours for the first like four days. So in my case, by the fourth day, I felt like I was starving to death. I recommend getting some applesauce and putting it in your fridge right away because I couldn't chew. I could barely move my mouth and I just, my throat hurt so badly. 
by the fourth day of not eating, I really felt like I was starving to death. I was so weak, I couldn't go up the stairs. John went to the store and he got me Soylent. So I don't know why I didn't think of this. I didn't even consider the fact that I would have a hard time eating after surgery. I just didn't make that connection. Soylent is like a protein beverage. I have a video about it on my channel, but it is supposed to be a full meal replacement drink, kind of like a Pedialyte. I don't know about SlimFast, but John got me Soylent and it felt like I, I felt like I was recharged. I felt alive again. So I would have two to three Soylent a day with an applesauce. Hey everybody, um, time for an update. It is, um, um, almost one week since surgery. Today is Monday and I had my surgery last Wednesday. Today I took my first shower before I've been taking baths and I made my own breakfast today which I was able to eat. I got dressed by myself too. Um, just wanted to give you an update because it's my second time in my office since surgery and uh, the first time I've showered and been able to wash my face. Um, not like a very satisfying face wash experience because I can't get the cast. I just touched it. Because I can't get the cast wet. I just wash, I just put water on a washcloth and washed, like wiped my face. The bruising on my eyes is a lot better. I can open my eyes now. It's only been since Saturday that I could open my eyes, so two days with sight before my eyes were swollen shut. Now I'm um, out of my prescription medication and I'm just taking Tylenol, but it is really hard to fall asleep because um, although I'm very weak and need to sit down and lay down, um, I have to be sitting up. I can't really, I can't really do any conflict. I can't really do anything kind of hard, um, any movie or show with conflict I kind of can't do. Um, for example, like the, um, the uh, first night I watched The Emperor's New Groove just kind of something really easy to take in. I kind of can't do anything hard or like ask any hard questions. I started Mulan and uh, when when they find out Mulan is a girl, I started to get overwhelmed and I turned it off even though I've seen that movie, you know, plenty of times. I can't explain that, um, but that's just what it is and I'm kind of just following that feeling. So I haven't played Animal Crossing. Uh, not that there's a ton of conflict in that game, but I, I, I don't think I can be met with any challenges right now. I can't smile or laugh, so it's kind of hard to express myself. Um, the kind of little bit of laugh I can do, uh, my partner thought I was making fun of him until last night when he knew I was genuinely laughing at something. Um, it's, more, it's like a honking sound. Um, so, late at night when I couldn't sleep, which is difficult because your sleep schedule gets really, really, really messed up because you just take sleep whenever it's given to you. And after a couple days, you're awake at 4 a.m. all by yourself because you've been asleep since 6 p.m. One of the first nights I was awake and just all by myself. And I thought, what have I done to myself? I felt so much regret. I felt so scared. I, I wish I could just take it all back. I looked in the mirror at my cast and your cast is not the shape of your nose. I didn't know that. My cast was so pinched. I thought that the surgeon had given me like this snatched nose and I kept thinking about like botched plastic surgeries and how scatterbrained my surgeon was and how all the signs were there so everyone would blame me if my surgery went wrong. Like. I think I was having a panic attack, but it went away. Luckily, the next day, I believe, was Saturday, so I was able to talk to my boyfriend and I felt a lot better. My post-op was eight days after surgery. This comes up really fast. At my post-op, I was able to bring my boyfriend for the first time 
but he had to stay in the waiting room. So he has never met my surgeon. I really needed him there. I had a hard time navigating and being by myself and, you know, feeling dizzy and feeling scared and having a cast on my face and all this stuff. So I do recommend a person. When I had asked the receptionist, oh, can I take the bus to the post stop? And they said, yes, that is someone who is very confident in my abilities. They shouldn't be. At my post stop, my surgeon took my cast off of my nose eight days after surgery and he took the initial set of stents out of my nose. I had two sets of stents in my nose. Took the gauze, I guess, and the stent out of the nose, and the stent is really big. Yanks it out. After that, the surgeon took a vacuum and sucked all of this stuff out of my nose and down my throat. Me, you know, I was like, oh, you don't have to do that. He's like, I literally have to do it. <laughs> so he sucked all of this stuff out of my nose, but I thought it would hurt a lot, but my nose was still actually numb. And even now I don't have hundred percent feeling in it. I hear a lot of people say that after plastic surgery, like I, after breast implants, I feel like I hear people say like, I still don't feel them yet. And I was like, huh? but it's true, it exists on your face, but when you like glide your fingers over it, you, you're not fully sensing that touch. After he pulled that vacuum out of my nose, I felt this cold rush of air through my nostrils. And I have to tell you guys, my nose had to have been so much worse than I could have ever imagined because I had never felt that before. I'm not making it up. I would tell you right now the surgery wasn't worth it. I felt a cold rush through both nostrils for the first time ever. It was air. I was breathing air. The sensation was so startling that I immediately started crying um, and the surgeon was like, <laughs> yes. And he just, just pet, pet my head. Um, but maybe, maybe that's satisfying for him. You know, maybe I, I actually, I felt really embarrassed. <laughs> I felt really weird about it. I'll tell you though, by the time I got to the lobby, my nose had filled back up with the liquid that he vacuumed out. I don't know what it is. Mucus, saliva, blood, plasma, mucus. Your nose is still healing and all of this stuff comes right back. But you can't blow your nose. It's too soon. There's still stitches and stuff inside and you can't blow your nose. You can create like an air pocket or something really horrifying. You don't even want to risk it. So, You just have to let it drip. I felt so bad. Like, what was this all for? Now we're back to square one. My surgeon didn't tell me anything about the drip because once he vacuumed it and pet me, he was like, see you later. That night, even though my cast was off, I put the face bra with the gauze back on to collect just all the stuff dripping out. Really, it's just clear. It was just water, but you can't blow your nose. So there's you can't do anything about it. And you can't breathe through it. So two days after post-op, I still had to sleep with the mask on because I was still mouth open. My throat was so raw that John went to the store and he got me these ice packs. They're shaped, they're long ice packs filled with like Orbeez and I would stick them on my throat. When I left the surgical center, I said that the nurses gave me a small basin with eye patches. Those are cloth patches that you put in the basin and you fill the basin with ice and water and you put the patches on your face because you can't put an ice pack or like a bag of vegetables over your face because it would put pressure on your nose. 
So I was doing those for a few days, um, but my cat would see the basin and knock it over. <laughs> so John got me these um, ice packs and I'll include a picture because they're definitely crucial. And I would put those on my eyes and I would put them on my throat. My eyes were super severe, super black eyes. They're like kind of fun, but your face is also super swollen at the same time. So you don't even like have a cute moment with them, I guess. After your nose stops just dripping clear liquid, you're gonna get slugs is what I call them. After I guess all that liquid and stuff starts to congeal as you're healing, you're going to get these long strands of mucus and you have to pull them out in order to breathe. I kind of miss them, but not really. Basically, it's just all that mucus kind of congeals and you can pull on it and the whole thing will pull out and you feel it pull from your throat all the way out. Do, 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 do. and then you have to do it on both sides and then you can breathe so it's like worth it i love showing my boyfriend like a gross thing but i did that privately after i had my initial first set of stents out i had another pair of stents in my nose as well oh surprise these were clear plastic stents I went back from post-op about three weeks. My surgeon checked my nose and he said he wanted to keep them in for two more weeks. If you follow me on Instagram, this was a very sad time for me because as my nose was starting to gain a feeling back, I became really aware of the plastic stents in my nose. They're almost like plastic spoons and you have that round part right here. So if I would smile, I could feel the stents. And the stents were also keeping me from tasting and smelling. I really couldn't smell, really couldn't. It's a very, it's a very strange sensation to be able to be breathing and smelling nothing. We borrowed John's mom's car for like a little day trip and she keeps her dogs in there. And halfway through the trip, John was like, I'm so sorry, it smells like dogs in here. And I was really like, Oh my God, wish my smell doesn't come back. I didn't know that. The only thing I could really taste was food that was like super dialed up artificial, like all dressed chips, super, super, super. Other than that, any fruit, vegetable, any organic food, I couldn't taste. After six weeks, I had my second set of stents taken out. And if you get curious and look in the trash can afterwards, they're really big, but you look at those things in the trash can and you're like, how dare you keep those in me? One of the reasons my surgeon wanted to keep my stents in longer was because I had a stretched septum that was also repaired during the surgery and my septum was stretched to a zero. It was really, really big, huge stretch septum insane. I was really relieved that that was a part of my surgery because it is something I have wanted to have fixed for years. I think because of the stretch septum being repaired, my nose now kind of dips up a little bit. And my bump in my nose, I feel like is a lot smaller. As the swelling goes down, I and can see the bump coming back, but undeniably my nose looks different. Overall in my surgery, I had a collapsed navel cavity repaired. I had my S deviation deviated septum repaired and I had my turbinates reduced, which are little I guess sinuses reduced. I also had scar revision surgery on my philtrum. As of right now, my surgeon could not tell me why my nose became so severely deviated. It can happen for a variety of reasons. My only theory is that my nose 
was broken when I was much younger. And as I grew and got older, my nose just continued to grow broken and cause more problems for me as I got older. I did not know the severity of my condition until recently. I did request the surgeon notes um, during my surgery. The surgeon wrote down notes afterwards. Because it is difficult to spend time with my surgeon and talk to him, I really didn't know the extent of my surgery. And now that I only have like one more appointment and then I have a six month and a year, I did request the surgical notes. And in that, that's when I saw that my nasal cavity was actually collapsed. Um, and that my deviation of my septum was so severe and that the turbinates were reduced. This is very severe and it's upsetting news to me because I think my nose was broken and then repaired. It is looking a little different to me, but my surgeon did tell me it will be one year of swelling until I know what my nose looks like. So I don't know. Now, what I struggle with the most is my stretched philtrum, which has makeup on it right now, so it might not seem as severe. And I do still feel pain in my nose. I can only describe it as, you know when you're going down the stairs and you hold your boobs? It's kind of like that, but I feel it in my nose. My next appointment with my doctor actually just got canceled, so I had to finally sit down and make this video, so I'm super happy that I did. I vlogged some of the recovery. Let me know if that's something you want to see. Maybe that'll get put on my second channel, which is Quicken2. That is the channel I update the most right now, so definitely check that out. I have the entire story of when I found out I was diagnosed with a deviated septum up on there. I will link it down below. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. I would love to do a shorter Q&A follow-up video. And then after my final appointment with my doctor, my next appointment with my surgeon are my like before and after recovery appointment, which I really wanted for this, but I digress. Thank you guys so much for your patience and hanging out with me and your overwhelming patience the last couple of months while I've been going through surgery. Like I mentioned, recovery was over a month of lost work. And if you are getting the surgery done yourself, I would say not even the recovery is the hardest challenge, but finding that time to take off of work, I found to be really difficult because I had to be super flexible in order to work with my surgeon. I love you guys so much. If it's your first time here, please subscribe. And even if you're watching this on your TV, remember to give this a thumbs up. It really helps me out a ton. I love you guys so much. I couldn't have done this without your support. So thank you. I love you and until later, bye.